Welcome. I'm Cameron Nardini, and today I'm going to be giving a brief presentation on Georges Lemaitre for my History of Astronomy class. So the agenda for today is to first give a brief introduction, followed by an overview of Lemaitre's life and career. We will then talk about his cosmological and physics theories in some greater detail, discuss why he went relatively unnoticed in comparison with Edward Hubble, and we'll examine how his theology, being a Catholic priest, may have or may not have influenced his theories. And finally, we'll touch on some conclusions and references. So, once again, my name is Cameron Nardini. I'm giving this presentation for my History of Astronomy class in American Military University with Dr. Wood. For this presentation, there is obviously a video which you are watching and the PowerPoint slides. I've also included the PowerPoint slides as an attachment, and the script for this presentation is included in the presenter notes. I will generally be following along with this script, but I may not be word for word, as I like to sometimes uh, go off on a tangent or not read directly from the slide. So feel free to watch, listen, read, or follow along with however you best see fit. Now, for those who still have no idea with what I'm presenting or talking about, who is Georges Lemaitre? Well, he was a Belgian physicist and priest in the early 1900s. He was a contemporary of Einstein and Hubble, and is regarded now as the first to come up with the theories of expanding universe and the Big Bang, or what he called the primeval atom theory. But he wasn't given much credit for it, and was kind of overshadowed by Edward Hubble. You can see him with Einstein in this picture here, along with Robert A. Millikan, the head of the California Institute of Technology, showing that, despite maybe his lack of recognition, he was indeed a peer of these great astronomers and physicists. So, let's go into a bit more depth on his life and career. Lemaitre realized early in his life that he had a passion for all things that required deep thinking and intense problem solving. He studied math and engineering in his college studies, as well as the classics in theology and philosophy, but because of practicality, he eventually earned his degree in mining engineering. Eventually, early into his mining engineering career, World War I broke out. He jumped on the chance to serve and completed his tour with honor and distinction receiving many different awards and citations. He even earned uh, what is the Belgian equivalent of the American Silver Star. After the war, he wanted to go back into academia and decided to continue his studies. He eventually earned a PhD in mathematics from the University of Louvain, which is where he got his first degree in mining engineering. After he completed his graduate studies and kind of achieved this big milestone in, in the scientific part of himself, he wanted to go back more into the spiritual side of things, and he applied to become a priest. He was accepted and eventually ordained in 1923, and he was actually encouraged by the church to continue his scientific endeavors. He earned a scholarship to do research at the Harvard Observatory after his ordination, and while there doing his research, he also simultaneously completed his second PhD in physics from MIT. So he has quite the impressive credentials. Throughout the 90s and 1920s and 30s, he worked extensively in cosmology, which is the study of the large universe as a whole. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail soon. He was uniquely suited for this task because of his extensive grasp of physics and math and his ability to work out these rigorous problems. But also because of his study in theology and philosophy, he was able to conceptualize abstract concepts that were kind of needed in the field of cosmology. An interesting note here is that all the while, the church was awarding him and encouraging him to pursue these studies and make these advancements. This wasn't the same church that persecuted Galileo and others years before. So let's talk in a little bit more detail about the cosmological theories he developed and what the state of cosmology was at the time. At the time, there were two primary models of the universe, Dutch astronomer William de Sitter's and Einstein's. De Sitter proposed a model in which the universe had negligible mass. Yes, there was mass, but it was vastly overtaken by the amount of empty space. 
This model accounted for the recent discovery of redshifting light uh, from what was confirmed to be by Vesto Slifer distant, uh, distant galaxies. In this model, in Desitter's model, the light was actually growing longer the further it traveled. Einstein's model, on the other hand, was a dense matter-filled universe that was kind of wrapped up in a hyperdimensional ball. This model accounted for the matter in the universe, but not the redshift in distant galaxies, which, at the time of Einstein's uh, development of this model, he may not have been aware of yet. Lemaitre was not really comfortable with either of these theories, because they both had some big flaws, some fundamental properties of the universe that they didn't account for. So, in 1925, while he was finishing his uh, his physics PhD, he began to develop his own model. He returned back to Belgium and published his new theory in 1927 in a relatively obscure Belgian journal. His model focused on mathematically applying Einstein's general, general relativity to a cosmological scale. And he proposed a universe in which the galaxies were increasingly speeding away from Earth the further away they got due to the expansion of the universe itself. And his model was not the sole idea. He provided the math to support it, deriving what would later be called Hubble's Law and Hubble's Constant. He even had the data to back his, uh, to back his theory using Vesto Slifer's data fit within the models he developed. He tried to convince Einstein of his theory in 1927, but Einstein wasn't convinced, saying, I quote, Your calculations are correct, but your physical insight is abominable. Also implicit in Le Matra's 1927 work was the idea that if you backwards extrapolated this expansion of the universe, it all would eventually converge into a single point. Lemaitre later worked on solidifying this part of the theory, which he dubbed the primeval atom. This was the idea that all matter and energy in the universe was at the beginning condensed into a single point, an atom, if you will, that eventually rapidly expanded outwards. This term was later coined the Big Bang, which we now know it as. It wasn't widely accepted, however, until the discovery of cosmic microwave background radiation in the 1960s, which was evidence of a residual leftover energy from the early expansion of the universe. Part of the reluctance of the refusal, or excuse me, part of the reluctance to accept Lemaitre's primal atom theory was its closeness to a kind of biblical creation theory, which made secular scientists uncomfortable. They assumed that because Lemaitre was a Belgian priest, he was trying to develop a scientific theory that would fit in with a biblical creation. More on this in a bit, because that wasn't exactly the case. So, by now we know Lemaitre discovered Hubble's law and Hubble's constant before Hubble, so why wasn't he recognized? Why didn't he get the same credit that Hubble did? After all, some scientists like Einstein were aware of his theories. Well, even in academia, marketing is still important. Lemaitre published his work in a low-impact, French-speaking Belgian journal, whereas the most important cosmological work at the time was being published in English in the bigger journals. This made it somewhat inaccessible to the other cosmologists. Furthermore, while Lemaitre was able to match his calculations with real data from Vesto Slifer and others, it was not the same as the new data that Hubble was generating and the fact that Hubble presented the data and the, the theories all at once and in much higher impact journals. This observational evidence and the way in which Hubble presented his work was key and was why he was recognized and Lemaitre kind of went unnoticed. There is also, there's no evidence that Hubble plagiarized Lemaitre's work. It appears that he arrived at the same conclusions independently. Also importantly, Lemaitre himself did not seem to be interested in the fame or glory of the accomplishment, which is fitting for a priest. When working on the English translation of his 1927 work in 1931, he actually omitted some of his key uh, paragraphs that were describing how he came up with what we now call Hubble's Law and Hubble Constants, because he knew Hubble already had the credit for it, and he didn't want to perpetuate any controversy. So at the time... He, uh, or excuse me, while he is now receiving recognition for his work, at the time he seemed more concerned with the advancement of his ideas than actually getting recognized for them. Now, Lemaitre's unique case is he's a figure with equal scientific and religious renown. 
That being said, I think it's worth briefly examining his outlook on science and religion, and how they work together, as his theories of the Big Bang could be twisted to support one side or the other in the secular religious debate. As I mentioned earlier, while nearly all scientists accepted Le Maitre's and Hubble's work on the expansion of the universe, most refused to believe that the universe had a beginning. They strongly preferred the idea of a universe that always was and always will be. Because they didn't want to be too linked with the idea of a biblical creation or a start to the universe. But it's important to note that Matra himself strongly opposed linking his ideas to any type of religious creation. For example, he said, and I quote, As far as I can see, such a theory remains entirely outside any metaphysical or religious question. It leaves the materialist free to deny any transcendental being. He may keep, for the bottom of space-time, the same attitude of mind he has been able to adopt for the events occurring in non-singular places in space-time. For the believer, it removes any attempt at familiarity with God. In a letter to the Nature Journal, he said, and I quote, Sir Arthur Eddington states that philosophically, the notion of a beginning of the present order of nature is repugnant to him. I would rather be inclined to think that the present state of quantum theory suggests a beginning of the world very different from the present order of nature. Thermodynamic principles from the point of view of quantum theory may be stated as follows. Energy of, quant of constant total amount is distributed in discrete quanta. The number of dis distinct quanta is ever increasing. If we go to the back in the course of time, we must find fewer and fewer quanta until we find all the energy of the universe packed in a few or even a single unique quanta. On his theological distinction between science and religion, I'll end with a final quote. Should a priest reject relativity because it contains no authoritative exposition on the doctrine of the Trinity? Once you realize that the Bible does not purport to be a textbook of science, the old controversy between religion and science vanishes. The doctrine of the Trinity is much more obtruse than anything in relativity or quantum mechanics, but, being necessary for salvation, the doctrine is stated in the Bible. If the theory of relativity had also been necessary for salvation, it would have been revealed to St. Paul or Moses. As a matter of fact, neither St. Paul nor Moses had the slightest idea of, the slightest idea of relativity. So Lemaitre is essentially saying, let's keep our faith and science separated. We can have both without sacrificing one or the other. They should work together, not in opposition. In conclusion, Lemaitre was a Catholic Belgian priest and is considered to be the father of the modern expansion of the universe and Big Bang theories. And only in more recent decades has he been receiving due credit. For example... What we know as Hubble's Law was recently renamed as the Hubble-Le Metro Law. He was a war hero, a brilliant scientist, and a caring priest, renowned in scientific and religious circles. He lived just long enough to see his theories proved with the discovery of cosmic microwave background radiation. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and I hope you learned something. And that will be it. To touch on the references, I took from Bartusiak's Dispatches from Planet 3, Glorfeld's uh, article on George Lemaitre, a article from a religious standpoint from La Rissi in 2009, and an article by Livio 2011 about um, Lemaitre actually editing out his English translation of his work. So once again, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and see you all later.